So good morning, first of all, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> Pleasure for me to be here. Uh, sorry about my voice, but the weather conditions here in London give me a hard time. So, <coughs> uh, but I will hopefully survive. Huh? Uh, my title of the speech today is changes, uh, Challenges in a Changing Automotive Environment. And certainly we can also add in uncertain times, as we just heard before. And if we talk about uncertain times, <coughs> A short glance to the recent sales and production figures in the automotive industry says it all. After record sales in 2007 and 2008, suddenly we saw a historic plunge. Uh, this was caused by a crisis in the banking sector, as you know, and an event unrelated to the industry. Uh, 2011, again impacted by a very tra tragic event outside of the industry, we see declining figures, which leaves us guessing where the industry is heading. And uh, for 2012, again, uh, we expect a growth between 3 and 5%. Uh, and actual production, we need to say that in Japan, Korea, Russia, and India are clearly above the expected values. However, we also see that the worldwide uh, production year-to-date plus 10% is exceeding the worldwide sales plus 5% over the last month. So you can mm, foresee that production will slow down to adapt again to the market requirements. So the question is where it goes. Long term, at least, we have a base scenario, as you said. Uh, we say uh, that there is a well-known and discussed uh, shift to Asia. The long-term outlook to 2019 uh, confirms this trend. The mature markets, Europe, North America, Japan, and Korea, will more or less be stable on the current levels. Uh, South America will grow around 5% average per year, uh, while Asia, mainly China and India, will grow roughly 11% uh, uh, a year to reach about 50 million units in 2019. That means more than US and Europe combined. Conclusion, the market grows in Asia, and therefore, we have to be prepared. Uh, let's take a short look on the situation in the UK. Uh, total vehicle sales will stay on a relatively stable level till the end of this decade. It's our assumption. Uh, net imports will strongly decrease due to the increased production for export markets also. Uh, and Basically, we will see an increase in production until the year 2020 uh, to roughly 2.5 million vehicles, which is nearly doubling the number from 2009. So it's a very good development, in my opinion, for the British or the UK production of vehicles. Uh, looking at the big picture, uh, we can identify several trends for the automotive industry that is heavily really impacting the industry. Uh, these range from the powertrain question over new mobility solutions to the strong growth in emerging markets, especially in Asia. Due to time reasons, I cannot really discuss all of, the, all of those trends in detail. Uh, the keywords on the left side are in everybody's mind and already have been discussed intensively. Uh, therefore, I will focus on the fundamental trends on the right side, which have to be watched carefully since their impact is not easy foreseeable. Okay, first let's talk about the powertrain uh, diversification. Coming from a very simple choice of two different concepts of the industry is moving towards a multitude of concepts for the future. Uh, this multiplication uh, of concepts means that the complexity in the marketplace and the necessary investments are rising as well. Uh, this amounts to parallel development effort, optimizing existing ICE engines and developing new electrified concepts. As a supplier, certainly we are committed as one of as the biggest supplier worldwide, we are committed to cover all important technologies ranging from the internal combustion engine uh, for to the future electric vehicles up to the fuel cell technologies. As just mentioned, we expect to see all different types of engines in the market. This picture shows the overall market figures in production for different technologies uh, in the future, how we see it. Uh, in 2020, we expect to see roughly 10% of hybrid and electric vehicles, whilst the rest will be covered with internal combustion engine. That means 90%. Now, <clears throat> you may argue 
that those numbers for electrification are too conservative. They may be. Uh, however, in any case, in 2020, the internal combustion engine is the dominant powertrain on a global base. Uh, legislation will certainly have a huge impact on the, let me say, broadening of electrification in the future. Considering that the traditional powertrain technologies will continue to ex uh, exist and play a major role in the overall mix, uh, it will be important to continue improving their efficiency. From today's point of view, we'll still see a potential only on the powertrain side for about 30% reduction in consumption. In total, including measures like roll resistance of tires, weight reduction and aerodynamics improvement, uh, this potential is more than 40%. Uh, this comparison between gasoline and diesel shows also pretty clearly that in the midterm, the diesel technology is the key to achieve the CO2 targets in Europe. Still in discussion in, uh, in a European Commission proposal on energy taxation, in the initial proposal it was planned to make diesel fuel more expensive than gasoline. Uh, this would jeopardize first reaching the CO2 targets in 2020 and second weaken our European competitiveness on diesel technology. In sum, it would be environmentally and industrially counterproductive. I'm glad that the European Parliament has rejected this proposal and that several member states, including the UK government, are opposed. However, we have to make sure that this will remain also the same in the future. Uh, next is the push for safety. Apart <coughs> from the electrification, the proliferation of safety technologies is a very important issue as accentuated by the recent UN initiative called the Decade of Action for Road Safety. On the left side is an overview of the vehicle population for selected countries and the corresponding fatalities. You can see a high difference of fatality risk in, the, in those countries. The risk in India is almost 20 times higher than Japan, as in India there are still almost no active safety systems in the market. But also, it's difficult to have no picture in front of you. <laughs> but, oh, sorry. <laughs> but also in the US and Europe, the risk is as close, as double as high as compared to Japan. Uh, there is a clear correlation between available safety systems and fatalities per vehicle besides road conditions and infrastructure. Safety requirements are pushed by regulation to reduce fatalities to a defined goal by active safety and driver assistance systems. Another important role uh, of the proliferation of safety technologies belongs to the OEMs. They improve brand positioning by democratization of active safety and driver assistance systems. Democratization in turn leads to higher production volumes, lower feature prices and faster market penetration. This picture uh, shows the installation rates for ABS and ESP in the major markets. You can see a clear difference between mature and emerging markets, a fact that was already seen in the fatality rates and mainly driven through the absence of ESP systems. Pushing safety technologies into all markets and in all segments is a huge but important challenge for the industry. Legislation is a key enabler for that higher penetration. Another development uh, you can see here in that picture is the development of pure safety technologies in combination with driver assistance systems uh, and takes place in the shown perspective. Ten years ago, uh, the fields of passive safety, active safety and driver assistance stood side by side completely independent. Today, the vision of injury-free and accident-free driving is the driver for intensified jointly measures. At this, functionalities like autonomous emergency braking, predictive pedestrian protection, or driver drowsiness detection will help. In the future, the vision will end with partially autonomous driving that will mer merge all safety and comfort aspects with the demand for uh, ecological <coughs> driving. Therefore, we need a new, today only planned functions, e.g. integrated cruise assist, predictive evasion systems, or maneuver assist. At the end, we foresee 
so-called hassle-free driving or in the direction to autonomous driving, what Google is already trying to do. In <coughs> recent years, society has experienced a change in the attitude towards uh, the car and mobility, especially in traditional markets. Ongoing discussions about sustainability have served as a catalyst, leading to new mobility solutions appearing on the marketplace at a fast rate. I don't want to go through all those drivers here. I just want to say the buzzwords emissions, mobility relevance, uh, demographic change is clear, uh, modal mix, uh, privatization, and uh, mobility concepts, as well as transport control in urban areas will get a major importance in the future. Mobility as a service, I show just one example here, is showing the change attitude towards new business models. And new business models are succeeding in the marketplace. Let's take the example here of North America and Europe for car sharing. The graph shows the development of vehicle availability and users. Estimate was done early in 2010, within a period of seven years only. In 2016, uh, there will be a market for more than 3.3 billion US dollar for car sharing models only in those two markets. Surely a conservative estimate, considering that ownership of car is getting less important in the traditional markets as in the future. So what will be the impact of the, in the automotive industry for suppliers and OEMs? Further important driver for this industry is the increasing regulation, as already discussed before, not only on the safety and emission side, as we have seen, but also on subsidies and trades. Uh, in recent years, a significant change in the world of regulation has taken place uh, in regards to CO2 legislation. Different to just a few years ago, every major region has introduced legislation which focused on CO2 emissions, not only emission, uh, or of particular matter or similar. In Europe, for instance, we have the long-term target, as you know, of 95 grams per kilometer in 2020. Other regions have similar goals or are bound to follow. Considering uh, a population of about 5 billion people in Asia in 2030, there is no other chance for that region than to follow with stricter regulation rather sooner than later. Linked to the regulation on emissions, every major automotive market have subsidies in place in order to promote the type of motorization that is favored. As you can see already, the type of subsidies varies greatly in the different countries. The only similarity is that nearly every country has promotions for electric vehicles in place. However, the form is already very different. For instance, in the USA, in the USA, there's a grant of a maximum tax credit of 7,500 US dollars. Uh, in China, they grant up to 60,000 Chinese yuan in five pilot cities for new electric vehicles. And Germany has no direct subsidies, but exempts electric vehicles from taxes for a period of five years. Uh, considering the approach in other markets like the US, in our opinion, a, con a coordinated European approach uh, seems necessary to ensure competitiveness, not just for incentives, but also for technical standardization. A third aspect, considering the regulation, is free and fair trade. Uh, <clears throat> looking at this chart, we see the importance of trade flows uh, in and out of the European Union for selected trade partners. The figures show the trade volume for automotive parts, including complete vehicles. And it is obvious that for the European automotive industry, it is extremely important to have free and fair access to all relevant markets in order to exploit their competitiveness. Ongoing discussions on the free trade agreements like Japan should also consider trade barriers with no import duty background. Uh, Taking this high trade surplus for Europe into account, we can say and proudly say that our European automotive industry is world class and highly competitive. As we have seen, the trend impacts the automotive industry significantly and the industry needs to adapt to this fast changing environment in order to be successful. 
The various trends just shown have an impact on the automotive value chain. This graph uh, exemplifies what we can see. On the one hand, uh, the suppliers are integrating upstream and partly cooperating with OEMs. At the same time, the OEMs are moving downstream from moving from a manufacturer to become a service provider for the customer. External forces that impact the value chain are changing mobility models on the one side and allow new entrants on the other side. These developments lead to new alliances in the marketplace in order to provide the mobility user with the mobility experience he is looking for. The combination of these factors also push back in the industry, altering the, these reactions and strategies of the companies at the same time. The just described change in the value chain has a strong impact on the overall industry landscape. We see changing relationships between the existing companies and new entrants to the industry as well. Only a few years ago, uh, the industry consisted of the OEM and the suppliers. Uh, today, you have to add mobility providers, IT, IT companies, energy and utility providers, as well as consumer electronic companies. All these companies are interacting, somehow cooperating, and even integrating with each other in order to be able to provide necessary products and services for the customers in the future. I'm not able, <coughs> really, to give you an answer as to who will be the winner in the future uh, in this fast-changing environment. I just want to mention that the one who is better able to manage fast-changing complexity has at least a good chance. Another impact is, for the point of industry, is reducing the time to market significantly. What you can see here is an example how OEMs are reducing their lead times in order to get to market faster and with more variants. In this case, in the matter of a few years, the time to market from the concept proposal to SOP has been reduced by 24%, while the number of variants has increased in the same time by around 43%. This shows that increasingly speed and flexibility are seen as key factors to succeed in the marketplace. So, I think I have talked enough about trends. To summarize, we see four main success factors that will have a great impact in the years to come. First of all, balanced growth. Uh, due to the strong growth in emerging markets, it is necessary to be present in the major markets with regional expertise, not just production, but also development, purchasing, as well as R&D. Speed and flexibility, the dynamic environment requires a quick and flexible organization which can adapt to market and customer needs faster than today. Cooperation, the multitude of powertrains and new technologies, the demand for cooperation in order to reduce individual development costs, gain speed and enable new business models. Last but not least, portfolio management, because the markets and customers are more volatile, I think a dedicated scenario of planning and a broad product portfolio with high innovation potential are necessary to steer companies through uncertain times. And I wish all of us good luck in the future, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.